Hello. Hi, Jess. How are you? Uh, I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Good. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for putting it on. Something really strange is happening, apart from you, but um, everyone else that came in, including Serena, is under my name. Yeah, there's three jades. There's three jades <laughs> here, which is I, it's really odd. I've never known that ever to happen, ever. Um, very strange. And I'm... I don't know if anyone else is joining us with video or whatever, um, but just aware of, of time. Um, we had 30 registrants, but you know how it is with this time of year as well, particularly. But uh, we are recording, as you know, so we can uh, share it out for anyone who didn't get to be here in person. Uh, OK, I'm going to share my screen and uh, begin with the presentation. So, hi, welcome. Um, as we're a small group, please feel free to jump in or type in the chat or unmute and uh, share anything that, uh, any questions you might have or any sort of insight you might have to support what's happening. Um, but welcome, thank you for joining us today to tools, uh, resources and strategies for engaging engaging youth in environmental action. Um, I'm Jade, I'm here on behalf of uh, Canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store and Take Me Outside, um, two nonprofits dedicated to getting kids outside for learning and connecting them uh, with their environment. And part of that that we're looking at today is really taking environmental action. So um, you can generally find me, I'm a physical geographer and environmental chemist, uh, an environmental educator and um, outreach and events manager for, for the nonprofit uh, outdoor learning store. And you can normally find me pontificating as you'll see here um, from kindergarten to grade 12s uh, on various parts of the sort of Columbia Basin. Um, of which um, it's incredibly important to acknowledge um, that where I live, work and play are the traditional and unceded territories of the Sinaiaks, the Tanaha, the Tshemuk uh, and the Okanagan Silks people. Um, for the Sinaiaks, Revelstoke, BC is uh, the land of the bull trout. And for the Tanaha, it's the, the land of the Mishkakas of the Chickadee and uh, the Columbia River is the Chickadee River there. I think... Um, Starting there, actually, one of the big things um, that I think it's important to recognise whenever we're taking environmental action is how Indigenous peoples have been doing that for thousands of years uh, without any um, fanfare and have been protecting and proliferating a connection with nature and, um, you know, seven generational thinking uh, that we seem to, as settlers, have very abruptly undone. So um, anything we're doing with environmental action for me, indigenous perspectives and knowledge and engaging with indigenous people is at the center of it. So I work uh, with all different age groups. Um, here I have some of the littler ones and we're down on the, the riverside and we do some fun stuff with um, beaches and looking at the way that sort of extreme weather might impact there. Um, I like to work um, in schools as well here we're on a field trip looking at nature through the seasons so um i dress up as a different seasonal fairy i believe this is my spring outfit with the flowery headdress um and even with this age i think uh, just a connection to nature a sense of wonder when we know it we protect it and so i'm doing that with them too uh, i also run guide um up in the mountains with older kids so we're up here this is the very receding baby glacier uh, in the Monashi Mountains. And um, these youth have to engage in some stewardship in order to get onto these trips for free. So um, all the way up to that sort of teenage level. And then with adults, I train um, people in the outdoors and climbing instructors and things like that. And people that spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, it's like, how do we connect with kids so that when they become recreationalists, when they become workers, when they're making their own decisions. Um, I've done this on six, um, in six different countries over the last decade, um, across four different continents, um, where I personally feel like all I do is learn constantly, constantly, constantly. Um, and 
yes, he is hoping that some of it um, has some value and impact. So I think, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir with you, um, but sometimes we have, um, you know, uh, policymakers or decision makers that maybe have a different view. Um, but converging evidence strongly suggests that experiences of nature boost academic learning, personal development and environmental stewardship um, from uh, this quite recent paper um, peer reviewed. And so you know, when we're out there, I will say we're not, this is not a break from learning, this is an outdoor classroom. And I think that the more we can learn outside, the more we can lean towards that environmental stewardship is the more we can have these action projects that um, create an impact. And uh, that's what I always try and do in my teaching. Um, saying that, I am very aware that um, depending where you are, um, outdoor learning is not equitable across Canada, because we have I live in British Columbia, we have a plethora of um, outdoor spaces and lots of classrooms with outdoor classrooms already built. Um, but if you're living in a low income or an urban area, it can feel a bit daunting to try and connect kids with nature potentially and have them take action. Um, you know, with something as simple as a silk tarp, uh, here we're playing a game and looking at the subnivian zone, the zone underneath the snow where the animals go in winter. We're talking about what would happen if there was no snow, if it was all falling as rain and how that sort of long term climate. So it doesn't have to be doom and gloom and a very simple piece of equipment. This works just as well without snow um, on a playground or a field. Um, so it's not all about taking kids out into the mountains and looking at pine beetle. There are lots of different ways to engage kids in environmental action wherever you are. This is actually a picture from our local paper um, from the Fridays to Future became a thing. So it's become clear to me that youth led and organized movements are a big thing and that uh, youth are feeling empowered to take action. Um, and now it takes place in seven and a half thousand cities and has engaged more than 14 million people worldwide and started with Greta Thunberg seeing, uh, you know, um, outside parliament every day saying that she didn't want to, um, you know, that, that she cared about the climate and this sort of climate change has now become a climate crisis. So I just think that youth really want it. And this was happening one day on Friday at, in my small um, area. And I think it's incredibly important um, to value that they have and want to take action and have the capacity to do that rather than sort of top down belittling. Uh, here I'm working uh, with some, some older youth this is a grade uh, 10 11 class and um we're looking at the different greenhouse gases and talking about their global warming potential in terms of uh, how much of it's in the atmosphere and then how long they actually remain there and one of the big things that i struggle with as a someone who did an entire degree on climate science is that um we the news dumb down the science so that it's easy for the naysayers to poke holes in it and um it's a lot uh, for the kids to absorb um but when we went through this with a very sort of simple i got them to line up and then they had to adjust themselves in order of least to most um sort of warming potential and how different it was um to what they thought it sort of challenged a lot of their commonly held beliefs the other thing is they're on their phones all the time. They're on social media and bad news sells, right? Um, we, we talk and I mean, it's impossible not to see where we are at the moment in BC, like the effects of these sort of rampant floods. We went straight from fires to floods. Um, it's, it's evident, but, you know, polarizing people, creating sort of anxiety, eco-anxiety without actually giving them any tools to move forward and take action on it is kind of the media's way. Like they want, you know, you sort of scared and suppressed and 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 freaked out. Whereas actually what we want to do is inspire them um, to take to take action. And one of the things I do as part of this when we did learning about the science, and then we went out and did some biodiversity transects in a managed uh, an old growth forest and talking about the way that climate change will affect um, biodiversity and what that means uh, in all kinds of ways. Um, I got them to, I printed out some 
social media posts. I printed out some peer reviewed science papers. I printed out some articles from the web about climate. And I just got the kids in groups to read it and summarize it. And then um, asked them what the like three key points were from it. And they did that. And then I said, okay, so who wrote it? Why did they write it? And they were all a bit sort of taken aback. Well, you didn't ask us that. And I said, well, I'm asking you now. And, you know, not one of them had looked at, you know, the name or what the precedence of where this particular piece of material come from. And that was a huge thing um, for us to be able to, you know, dive into is the information you're getting good? And I think when they are shared, if we give them good information, they will take action because the best information will confirm that we need to take action. It's a climate crisis. We need to do it. And we want to move away from this feeling of, of stress. And so many kids from all age groups I'm seeing are stressed and worried about the future of their planet. And um, getting them to take action is, is a really important thing. And starting with critical thinking uh, as a way of sort of disseminating the information that's coming into them. So I'm going to talk about some very specific tools and resources that I use. And yeah, in fact, they are available on the learning store. But we've curated this list um, with the feedback of teachers, educators, school boards um, from people out there in the field. And we hope that we've you know, connected you with some things that could really help you take action. So um, the very incredible um, sort of world renowned education professor, David Sobel, uh, says no doom and gloom before grade four. Right. Don't go dark and stormy. Um, they can't comprehend it. The emotional maturity isn't there. So so much of what I do with the little ones is just silly and, and game playing and such. Um, but one of the things I love to do is listen um, to sort of enviro music. Um, so Remy Rodin has these two albums. And they're like catchy. You can do arm things. There's like sequa habitat. Say what? Like it's what? What's that habitat? And then he talks about think about the planet. He talks about plastic pollution. He talks about caring for our water. And they are so catchy. If you play one at the beginning of your class or a program, or it, you, you have everyone in raptures, including the adults. So that's a one key way that I think we can take action is just to sort of drip feed these ideas, but in a very fun way. Um, the next thing that I'm really doing is working with indigenous resources. So something like Silo in the Land, um, which is a story um, from three different uh, First Nations um, coming together. And it's uh, a little bit of a sort of moralistic tale about going out and caring and not taking all, all of the plants that, you you know, just taking enough and, and caring about the environment. And it just introduces them to uh, a situation where they're aware that you know, resources are finite and that can happen really early on. Um, actually, we have an amazing connection um, with this Indigenous um, book producer, Strong Nations, and it's all um, Indigenous authors and artists uh, from across First Nations from all across Canada. And I think connecting in with these historical stories that um, work that share so much of a connection with nature that it is impossible not to see the care and affection there. And that for me, again, is the start of environmental action, is the caring, it's the awareness, it's the um, talking about nature. You know, for them, trees and animals are people. They're not humans, but they're people. And I think when you give that connection, and I do this also with puppets, with the little ones putting on puppet shows, asking them to really feel what it would like to be in that animal's shoes if we cut down all our old growth and the caribou of nowhere to be, it really inspires them to take action in their own lives, of to speak up about what's important to them. So that's my first stop. Um, Natural Curiosity is a book um, that they're based out of the University of Toronto and everything they do is around Indigenous perspectives. So um, their key principles come like a growing tree and it all flows into one another. And um, it's a very balanced uh, and inquiry based um, way of, of teaching. And with that inquiry comes questions. And when we question, we develop critical thinking. And then with that critical thinking, we can make better choices. Uh, so 
starting them young is is fantastic um the big book of nature activities i like because it's seasonal so when we can introduce weather we can introduce climate and it seems um you know i i do a, a powerpoint sometimes like what's weather and they say rain snow sun and i say what's climate and they're like oh and i'm like it's just many days of sun or rain or snow you know and and these seemingly quite complex um ideas and concepts are quite readily absorbed um it's it's for me there's lots of opportunities in there and, and there's lots of continual so you can go to a tree and you can look at the same tree all through the seasons and i think seeing that change introduces temporal and spatial change awareness which seems very fancy but actually it sinks in really easily with them uh, the next one for me is the school garden curriculum um so a big thing with um you know when roads get washed out in main highways is food security where i live that shelves were empty for two days and people panicked lots of people grow their own food here in in the spring summer but i work a lot with kids talking about food and travel and emissions and so if you can talk about how it's better to have food that you've grown and that's seasonal and that is meant to be grown here or maybe you build a greenhouse um, and there are funds for that, right? Learning for a sustainable future have funds. The HGTF, if you're in BC, have these go grants um, or leap grants for the older years where you can ask for funding to actually create these projects. Uh, and yeah, there's lots across the country as well. And, you know, teach them about food and then grow something. Or let's talk about pollinators and how important they are for food production. And then let's plant some pollinator native species. Let's talk about invasive species and which ones, um, you know, are out competing. And the fact that, you know, bees can't make pot the right sort of pollen with, with invasive species. And, and all of these things tie back into them saying, oh, but I want to see the right plants. Oh, I'm definitely not going to... Um, you know, use insecticides, insecticides, or I'm going to tell my parents not to use insecticides on our veggie garden. And all of these things are a stepping stone into taking action. The next bit is when we get out there doing the equipment. So we do have guides about pollinators. I think giving kids field guides, something to hold on to while they're out there, focuses them in quite a sort of wild environment sometimes using uh, indigenous um, field guide resources, learning the native lames for things, um, Eskumu for Saskatoon Berry. And it just, I think when you connect to the history and the culture, again, we're looking at temporal change. As they grow into their next years of education, they will start to see, but ah, there used to be lots of this and why is it not there? And then they start to tie that into our human influence without potentially it being too overwhelming. I do pond dipping with kids and look at insects and talk about the fact that we found this particular uh, macro invertebrate and that means that the water is clean. But what would happen if the water wasn't clean? Who would who would who would be in trouble when it's not just the humans, it's the fish and just connecting their awareness of our cycles and everything all together. Uh, and how everything impacts everything means that as they progress and we move straight from a place-based education model of caring just about where we are and they start connecting to the world at large around them, then that feeling of care and empathy is already instilled. One of the things I did with those that picture earlier with the kids at the beach is I got them to build mouse houses. So they build me a shelter with sand, with mud, with twigs, with leaves. And then I come in and you do need to be near water realistically in order to do this properly. But I come in with a watering can and a big sheet of sort of metal that I wave to create a storm and rain. And we see how well their mouse houses hold up to extreme weather. And we talk about the fact that, you know, they're obviously not homeowners, they're six. But when we need to think about what the future is going to be, is that we're going to have to build stronger, more resilient homes, because otherwise we're going to struggle to keep cool and keep the heat out or, you know, to stay warm if we plunge into another global ice age. But, you know, we don't need to go that deep. But there's just like these fun sort of practical activities. Um, I love bird watching with kids and talking about the fact that you know how important our trees are not only is the lungs of the planet 
but um, for homes for birds and habitat and just anything that connects them in with that. Um, if you buy sit pads for your kids, they moan less. I think that's really the biggest thing. I also use um, a sit pad to create and designate a spot where they can sit and journal or um, sit and have quiet time and have a moment of reflection. I find that that gives them an opportunity to um, embrace the wilderness and also be calm uh, and even if you are in a busy urban place you can do this you can count the sounds on your fingers of how many you hear in a minute and then ask how many of those sounds were natural or how many of those were man-made and that can create its own discussion about how much space we have and how clean it is is it polluted uh, and that can be air pollution, it can be noise pollution, all of these things that just wake up the senses and the awareness of what's going on. Um, I just wanted to share this with you because this is a project that I've done um, with one of my grade five, six classes. So they are um, gift ideas that are experiential uh, and waste free. So it says gift give gifts that love the planet, give the gift of experiences. So we've got skiing passes, gift cards, get a tour on a snow bike, go to the art gallery, give people, you know, more online cards, a tour at the glass blowing. Okay. And um, the students are putting these up in our busiest cafe on the wall. And this was my grade five, sixes little environmental action that they took before Christmas to think about waste. And you know, it really, um, they were so proud uh, of what they've done and it got them thinking at nine or 10 and not rather than, you know, everything being about stuff. And what did you get for Christmas? You know, just shifting that mind frame to experiential. Um, and yeah, these are going up in our local cafe and um, it was featured in our, it's gonna be featured in our local newspaper. So it kind of just creates this awareness and, um, yeah, makes me really happy. As we get older, um, we can get a little bit more complex and into um, the sort of realities of some of the um, deeper issues. So um, starting again uh, with indigenous knowledge, uh, Groundswell is this incredible book um, that recognizes a call to action. It makes a great uh, opener for your day to read parts from. Um, and just really, I think, connecting in, just drawing that brain away from our consumerist society and just bringing them to a place where they're thinking about things and taking ownership. It's a great place to start. Um, connecting the dots from learning for a sustainable future um, is really, really fantastic. Um, there's a lot in there about uh, sort of climate based uh, action ideas uh, that we can take. Um, the curriculum for the earth um does this amazing um indigenous people's uh climate summit so you get the kids in groups and you um are given each of them a scenario of a different indigenous group you know maybe they're from the island of Tuvalu which is basically now gone from sea level rise flooding um and um before that their entire sort of groundwater became um was in flooded with with saline water and became uh, non potable and uh, they had to import all of their food uh, and the idea of sort of um you know climate refugees um some of these sort of deeper concepts can start to be examined and then they have to write about um, and perform to the summit what they would do and what they would ask the world to do to help support them going forward and it gets them thinking about strategies and how strategy is related to policy and actually decision makers and how they can actually be a part of that though. Um, we also talk in connecting the dots about writing letters, writing letters about key climate, doing the research and then looking at key climate factors that are affecting our community, so keeping it place-based and then writing letters to decision makers to show that they care. Um, we have a book about the Columbia River called The Heart of a River, which again is um, sharing indigenous uh, history and culture and then looking at the way that hydroelectric power you know a, a renewable resource has also impacted very heavily on the quality of the water and the habitat for salmon and what we're looking at there is balance what i always want to do as well when we're taking action is not to just 
you know, I live in a town that is um, only exists because of logging and uh, a railway that moves coal. And it's really important not to demonize students whose families perhaps still work in primary resource industry or things like that. So I think when I read that book, we then talk about the balance of, you know, what we get for what we give, but how, you know, science has progressed in order to allow us to do this more cleverly. Um, again, Not Extinct is um, a series of collection of Sinaiq's uh, First Nation stories um, that are about the animals and the natural landscapes. And they're, I mean, some of them are pretty dark and they're very deep and um, they resonate. And these are all just, yeah, about stimulating that feeling again. If you're really looking for like very key um, sort of activities to do, the teaching kids about climate change and teaching teens about climate change, Green Teacher, uh, edited by Tim Grant. I mean, these are these are golden. So lots of scenarios. Uh, we do like a carbon cycle one where you get a bunch of scenario cards. They have to roll a dice and they basically learn how the carbon cycle not only just travels around, but how it's stored and what happens if you put inputs and outputs in. So we start to talk about things like that and then how we can take that knowledge into so what are we going to do about it and you know there are some sort of personal choice things short shower challenges things like that but it also talks about um connecting them to the wider stage again so to some of the decision makers i think is is a really big thing um one thing that kind of gets put aside with environmental action is light pollution and i don't know where you guys are living but um for us you know it scares birds it throws their circadian rhythms off and if you've got older students um going out i mean in the winter it's pretty dark pretty early right but going out on a night walk got somewhere where you can start a fire on a clear night looking for constellations there are some amazing uh, first nations stories that connect uh, with the different constellations as well that are very beautiful uh, and we can talk about the way that our you know solar system um works and and which is connected again to the way that our climate system works you know the way the changes in orbit around the sun um so with this then get them to start a fire and look at how that changes their ability to see the stars and how that would be for animals and i think that's a really fun uh if you have the capacity to do something outside of school if you're in a recreational group something that can go down really really well um a big one that i do a lot with from Grade nine up basically is water quality testing uh, and getting one of these kits for your school would be just, it's a dream. Um, because we go out and, you know, you're not only just testing all the sort of basic parameters, but you're getting an understanding of that environment around you. Uh, this is Montana Creek, uh, which is the outlet um, that drains um, our ski hill in Revelstoke. It's not our drinking water. We go and visit our drinking water um, watershed and our uh, our creek that that comes from um, but this area was created actually or managed to create this pool um, that allow fish to spawn but what they didn't do was dig it on a deep enough angle so it basically infills with sediment and is blocking the um, culvert that drains the mountain and so even being here not only do we test water quality uh, looked for macroinvertebrates, we were talking about how when we try and manage environmental ecosystems, we often don't do a very good job. Um, we talked about the fact that where they're standing now used to have trees on it, and they cut those down in order to access this pond for the fish. But fish need very cool water to breed. And the shade that those trees provided has negatively impacted the number of fish that use this pond over the last couple of years. So just sparking these conversations has been really important with younger kids or even this age group as well. Do a creek cleanup. Just go and pick up garbage for a day. It causes an amazing amount of engagement. Then do your water quality testing, get them to write a report as a class or each gets a section and then send it to your council. Share with them these things. Um, again, just made the voice heard, I think. So we also made um, posters and um, that's my friend and my dog. Um, but we, you know, 
this bylaw, check your time. There's a bylaw that states about water because when we use water, we use energy and it also affects its water quality, particularly when you have a rain fed or snow fed watershed like we do. Uh, the kids made these posters. They were incredibly proud. Uh, of what they did and they've been on view all um, summer in our community and have been remarked on by a bunch of people um i think that's that's pretty much me wrapping up that was quite rapid fire um i think yeah one of the biggest things um as well that i didn't mention when i'm talking about some of the activities in these books is they're very engaging they're very practical um we do one as well where we have the kids make a circle around the sun and their job is to run into an inner circle and tag in and out and they're the sun's energy and then we put a bunch of different influences in there into what blocks their way or makes it easier for them i think anything that's sort of practical um which a lot of these books have these sort of outdoor games you know where the learning goes in through uh, understanding the game as opposed to the complex under sort of concept um, has been really powerful for me as an educator in connecting uh, and inspiring uh, youth action. Oh, one thing as well that we're doing, um, talking of bylaws, is that we have um, an anti-idol bylaw that's really not being enforced. And uh, so we connected with um, our high school and they do have an environmental action group but a teacher or a class could easily take this on um and we went to the city council and we said hey look we need buy no idling signs and they said okay maybe and we said okay what about if we get a little grant from a local non-profit so talk to your local non-profits ask them for money or look at some of these grants and we said look we've got 500 bucks can we get the kids to design the post the the signs and we'll have them made if you'll install them and they said yes so it has to have you know the city of revelstoke logo on it and it has to have um this particular information but you know we then give the students a template they're going to design um their signs and then the city council gets to vote on their favorites and then they're going to create these signs and they're going to put them in the key spots outside the school outside the groceries um, so that's, you know, a little practical art and engagement um, project. The second thing they're going to do is go out and survey people who are idling in our town, supervised and, you know, in a very gentle manner. Um, but going up to people and asking them, do you know that if your engine is running for more than three minutes, you know, you're wasting more gas than you would to turn it on and off again? or that you are polluting our environment. I understand perhaps you want to stay warm, but you could get out of your car and do some jumping jacks if you're waiting. And so they're going to go out and sort of connect with people in the community. And we do have a lot of tourism as well here um, in their little way to take action for their local place. So that's gone down really well. And um, they're pretty excited about implementing that. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts or ideas? Okay, in that case, um, I'm going to hand off to Serena, who's going to talk about um, more of how um, online engaging youth and the way that you can connect them that way. And I'm going to uh, just put the links in the chat for Take Me Outside. They have a learning challenge if you're an educator or connected to any educators that um, will give you an opportunity to get resources about teaching about climate and the environment uh, and the outdoor learning store. Uh, but I shall stop my share and thank you for listening. I had one quick question, Jade. Yes. Would you also be able to share the um, books that you mentioned? I know there were images of them, but I didn't capture all the names. Absolutely. So I'm going to send a follow up email to every registrant and there'll be like a list of resources that I've talked about and uh, the names of some of the activities and things that you can you could connect with. Thank you. Thanks. I also have a question, Jade, and it's OK. It's like kind of a I don't know. You don't have to answer. If you, but I just like thinking about um, uh, what do you like? Because you know how they're redesigning the BC curriculum, right? So right now, climate change only enters in grade seven, and so they're going to try to introduce it, you know, in lower grades. Um, kind of with your experience, like on the land and teaching outside and and teaching climate change. What do you see? Kind of are like might be the gaps between kind of like the climate uh, curriculum that's being taught in schools and you know, where there might be opportunities for, you know, me as a program director, for example, to design programming that would be, you know, 
that would supplement what's going on in the school. And yeah, and that's like a really big question. I'm sorry. Uh, but no, I mean, I, yes. of, is big. it just a disconnect between land, like being on the land or? Yes, I think I think the key thing is the indigenous connection piece is looking at um, historical plant and medicine use, for example, um, the way plants coexist together, the fact that Douglas fir and birch tree um, share nutrients, the mycorrhizal networks. And you can teach you can teach kids because they understand the Internet at five. You can teach them about the underground Internet and it blows their minds. Um, and I think just. So indigenous connection, the fact that if I stomp over here for a hundred square kilometers, so, you know, I talk about salmon arm because that's a hundred kilometer drive an hour away, all the way over there, it impacts the fungi network underneath the ground. So I think just that building those connections with what I do impacts that. Uh, so indigenous connection and um, sustainability. Okay, so when we're talking about climate, it's talking about what I do has an impact and you can introduce impacts without doom and gloom. So if we think about um, if I snap trees off, you know, it, then I'm, I'm reducing their ability to produce. Talking about um, the way that different plants and animals live in particular little sort of bubbles of, of, of weather. And if it changes really quickly that they're not gonna be able to survive. I talk about wildfires. We play a game called Fire in the Forest, where, um, which is, I don't know if you know the coyote mentorship, but it's a, a play on that. But talking about wildfires are natural, but what isn't natural is that they're getting bigger and they're burning for longer and they're burning hotter. And so we play the game where it's basically bulldog, you know, they have to get to the other side and the burning tree tags them, but you get them to choose three animals that live in the forest that would be impacted by fire. And then you ask them to act like the animal. You ask them to engage with it. And actually, I didn't mention um, Gillian Judson's book, but a walking curriculum and engaging in ecological information, imagination, <laughs> engaging in ecological imagination. Ooh, it's a mouthful, but it's worth it. Um, talk so much about res it, things have to resonate with them. And if you engage their imagination, it will. So I think care and affection uh, and an understanding that what they see in the sky is connected to the animals that live there. It's connected to the water that runs past them, the water that they drink, anything to do with going and connecting with water. And the fact that the water they drink now was the same water that was sipped out of puddles by dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And they might not understand the number, but the idea that it's, it's all one and the same that has had the biggest key uh, connections for me. And then, yeah, with the older kids, um, I don't know what your programming sort of age range is looking at, but I wrote a, a climate science program for, for grade nines. You know, like we dumb it down, but, and lots of people don't understand how it works, but, you know, NASA website has some incredible diagrams of like Milankovitch cycles and the way our orbit changes and we wobble and tilt and all of that kind of stuff that really connects with them and then take them outside and get them to look at shadows and and different topography and and where the sun's rising and setting and what impact that's having and do they see if you know it was hotter during the day where would where would the animals be shaded you know like it just Anything that's, that's like me, I'm not separate from this natural environment. I am part of it. I'm one with it. And the indigenous perspective, perspective of being ecocentric is so good. Uh, it's so, yeah, important, uh, but we've kind of stepped out of it. Um, you know, if you've got kids obsessed with technology, get them out there, get them to take pictures, use um, plant ID apps get them to participate in biodiversity bio blitzes or the iNaturalist um, competitions, get them out there looking, observing, making notes, starting to think like a scientist, starting to pay attention and the rest will do itself because it's just sort of like, oh, there's less birds here, you know, or the fact that our Western toads hatch so late because they couldn't come out in the heat this summer that, so many of those toads won't have survived because they won't have made it back before the snow. 
um yes that kind of stuff that that's place-based to you but I yeah sorry I rambled a bit there. no that's Only awesome. little, thank you so much little little <laughs> bit passionate just a tiny little bit <laughs> um okay Selena Serena sorry I saw Selena's name hi Selena Serena I shall be quiet and pass it to you no worries thanks Jade I was just mesmerizing all those resources holy smokes so much out there okay I'm gonna share my screen make sure it works okay okay is that visible to everybody is there yeah awesome thanks. thank you jade hi everybody uh my name's serena uh thanks jade for the intro uh, i am a communications consultant so i'm going to try and not focus too much on technology today even though i do spend a lot of time on it as i'm sure all of us do these days uh, but today, I, I do really want to focus on engaging with youth uh, at a larger level. Uh, in the work that I have done um, working in communications, I have focused more particularly on environmental education organizations, uh, specifically certain outdoor ed programs um, and other nonprofits that are doing work to get youth outside. Uh, so it's a bit of an oxymoron. I know I work in communications and I work online, but uh, my passion that I share with Jade and which I assume I share with most of you is outdoor education. Um, it's just the method of getting kids out there and engaging with, with the outdoors sometimes um, does have value online. And so that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today. Uh, and then I feel like I might be talking a bit too much about technology. And so I did throw in some um, conversations about the programs I have worked with um, one that I'm continuing to work on that I think you would all probably find quite interesting and, um, and perhaps we can have some conversations about that as well. Okay, so just to get started, um, a little bit about me. Uh, so I was born and raised in White Rock, BC, and while I do call Vancouver, Metro Vancouver home, uh, I've spent the past few years moving around the country and around the world. Uh, quite frequently. Um, I've traveled to quite a few countries and most recently was living in India just before the pandemic, um, but now back in Canada, thankfully. Uh, I'm a big soccer fan. Um, I am a big Disney nut. Uh, I am a vegetarian. And I think most importantly, I enjoy advocating for and protecting our natural environment, which I assume I probably share with, with most of the people in this room. And so while I believe there are many ways to enjoy, advocate for, and protect our environment, I am here today to speak more so about um, how doing this online can have impact. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to come from engaging online, um, but as long as the end product is getting youth outdoors, whether that's conversing with students, whether that's conversing with teachers um, and giving them resources, all of these ways of engaging kind of lead to that end goal of outdoor learning, um, environmental ed, and, and practices in that industry. So that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today. Um, to give a bit of an idea of where I'm coming from, I've dropped a few names on the slide because I wanted to let people know that my background hasn't always been in environment, um, as you can see. My favorite part of my work over the past couple of years has been working with more environmentally focused organizations, um, but I think I wanted to make note of it because of the fact that these organizations that do tend to have more resources are the ones um, that are succeeding in their engagement, and I realized quite quickly that that was unfair and that there are so many organizations that they're doing great work that don't have that same access to resources when it comes to engagement. Um, and not only do they need it just as much, but I, I would argue even more. And so BC Parks, ISC, and quite a few others that you'd see if um, I can share the link to my website, I've got kind of other organizations I work with uh, and work with currently are ones that you know we probably are more familiar with don't have those same kinds of resources and so today i want to share some strategies that i think will relate to that um, but like i said i'm going to focus a bit more too on talking about programs and and other areas of, of the work that i've done in the past which are these organizations so these 
are most recently the organizations I've worked with and am currently working uh, for. I think Selena's in the room as well here from C2C. Hi, Selena. Uh, Take Me Outside, Youth for Action Element Society are kind of the main groups I've been working with for the past three years. I obviously shifted away from where the corporate orgs as soon as I could because that's not um, where my passion lies. And I've been doing great um, work with them and got the opportunity to work with some amazing projects, specifically some outdoor ed and environmental ed programs, which I'm really excited to talk about today. And before I get into that, I did just want to ask the room, and I know we're a small group, so if you want to unmute yourself, you can feel free to answer this question, um, or you can also just pop it in the chat. But I was curious to hear what your biggest challenges were when it came to engaging with youth, um, not necessarily online, but just in general. Um, I'm hoping some of you would have challenges online so that I have some relevant content for you, but <laughs> is anything else? I think one of the older ones for me is getting them into off of social media or gaming or um yeah basically those two um into engaging with content that is um yeah environmental or activist or that sort of mm -hmm. thing just is getting older stuff, students yeah. focused mm. mm -hmm. awesome. well cool. so i'm first going to talk about and if you have anything else to continue to put them in the chat, I have it open on the side here. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the three kind of buckets that I'll be chatting about today. So fresh and reliable messaging. So this first piece, I am gonna talk a bit about how to engage youth online and why it can be a really powerful tool, um, especially working with some organizations like Youth for Action, um, if anyone's heard of them, they do a lot of work with high school students. And as of recently, most of their network has been living online. Um, and they've been doing some really powerful engagement, um, not just through social media, but um, through other means as well. Knowing your students. So I'm going to chat a bit about uh, my programs that are not my programs, but programs I've had the opportunity to work for and on over the past couple of years um, and how programs can get very niche. Uh, and knowing your students and what inspires them and what can motivate them, I think really strongly relates to a lot of the programs that are out there. Similar to what Jade was talking about when it comes to these resources, there are so many that I think it often can be overwhelming. Um, and I find it is a lot easier if you take that step back and think about what your students want um, and what's motivating to them. And then lastly, I'm gonna just chat quickly about a couple of the programs um, as well. Okay, so I know, uh, and I am in there as well, I'm not the biggest fan of, of spending a lot of time on social media. I know it can be very toxic and it is a, quite a controversial topic. Um, but from my experience, I have seen a lot of positives when it comes to social media and using online engagement. Um, youth are on there to build community. So I think it's an important piece that gets missed, but despite the toxic pieces that come along with social media, um, it's also where a lot of relationships are built for these students. Um, it's also where activism is starting. So I do have lots of students that I've worked with who have created social media Facebook groups. They've done their TikTok videos, all of these things to advocate for environmentalism. Um, and it can be used correctly um, with the right direction. Uh, email marketing as well. I've actually worked with students who have taken the skill to the next level and they've actually engaged with not just other students, but connecting communities across BC um, to come together for a larger cause. And green teams, conferences, programs, and things like that. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Burnaby Youth Sustainability Network, um, Vancouver um, Sustainability Conference, those sorts of things. All of these are created online, um, promoted through social media channels, all by students. And they're just ways that students are able to connect and actually utilize tools that are available to them that otherwise maybe not have been. So this is an example of um, Youth for Action. When I talk about fresh and reliable messaging, they do a really great job um, of kind of translating their message into what they're doing. So this program, uh, works with high school students, um, typically around grade nine to 11. 
And they do get students outside. So the uh, base of their program really is to connect students in the Metro Vancouver region with um, people, place and planet and teach them about resources um, and all related to sustainability. But it's often that the messaging that they use to connect with other students and to um, bring the community together is really meeting them where they're at and putting reliable messaging out there that actually connects to these students as opposed to turns them away. And so when we talk about students being on social media, this could be seen as one of those positives where we do have a very strong following from youth and we get engagement from them. That's pretty amazing. Um, we talk to them directly through our DMs. We engage with them through comments um, and we're able to just connect with them on a different level that often, especially now, um, isn't available in person. Can I just yeah. say, like, the Jeez. pictures um, where there's clearly, like, kids doing some kind of self-led, like, interpretation bottom left there, and, like, the combination of outdoor programming with then sharing that message from some youth leaders further afield is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank Get you, the yeah. Best of both worlds. Yeah, I like that as well. Um, and I think it is neat to see too that they there are lots of, I mean, I haven't posted all of these, but there are lots of messaging that happen in that aren't necessarily directed right at, you know, student being out, outdoors, right? But students being, um, you know, celebrated for what they're doing. Um, and we often try and mirror a lot of our audience through social um, and it does allow them to connect a lot more with us. Um, this one might be a bit too deep, especially if um, no one in the room uses social media too much and or it's new to them when it comes to engaging with youth. But one of the biggest, if we're looking back to it, this Instagram post and we're seeing um, a lot of these messages that maybe aren't something we want to get across. Um, the listening piece when it comes to connecting with youth online, I think is really important. Um, we use an example of... Um, um, if it's National Pancake Day and you're posting about waffles um, online, you're not going to get as much as game engagement. Uh, and a lot of that does come with that listening piece of if you're not online and you're not aware of the messages that they're using, um, the channels that they're being engaged on, um, or just the language that they're using, it is tough to reach them. And it's tough no matter how much you post or how much content is relevant. Um, it changes every day. And I think all of us know that being online and being on social media things change quickly and students are just as aware of this as we are. Um, you know, they have access to a lot of the same channels as we do. So when we're talking about posting and trying to reach these students, um, that listening piece is gonna come in uh, very strongly and is one that often gets missed. Meeting students where they're at, um, again, this kind of comes back to having those channels available to students um, and knowing them well. Uh, I don't need to get into metrics or knowing what your students are on, but if you are trying to reach them, um, channels, language, and content are the ways that that's going to happen. Okay, and then this is going to lead us, um, I'm going to try and be quick here, this is going to lead us into programs. So just talking about knowing our students and um, shifting away from that online piece um, and just talking about a couple programs that do exist out there um, that I've helped uh, kind of engage with students through online means with the goal of outdoor education. So this is an example of um, a program that's engaged youth really successfully. I think I talked about Youth for Action a bit. Um, this is a, a couple photos from the CDC Professional Development Conference back in 2019. Some of you might be familiar with um, and Youth for Action students um, on this day actually came out to join in this professional development conference, which for me was really groundbreaking to see. Um, these students were from grade, like I said, nine, nine to 11, and they were actually in these workshops with the students. And so the students themselves, I think, had come from a place not necessarily of responsibility, um, but they ended up spending this weekend with uh, teachers from across the province, learning about different ways to engage with students. Uh, and I think for Selena or anyone else who might've been at that conference, if they were present when the students were there, uh, a lot of the times it did feel like they were students, like the responsibility that they were given um, just to be there, I think gave them this motivation and the responsibility itself um, just shone through and really became different kinds of students that very day. So 
this is one example of, um, you know, knowing your students and knowing what passions they have and what responsibilities they can take on can actually be pretty amazing benefits. This was, yeah, if anyone was at this conference, please feel free to post in the chat. It was a pretty amazing day. Okay, this is another really fun um, program. Again, with knowing your students, you could talk about the responsibility piece, but um, there aren't very many programs out there that work on um, the connection and the intersection of environment and food. Uh, but it is such a big piece of sustainability, and it often gets lost in a lot of the conversations about climate change um, because it is a touchy subject, especially when you bring in culture and you bring in um, relationships to food. This program um, by Element Society and Unbounded, uh, it's called Eco Cooks Club, and they actually work with K to 12. Um, they're establishing new pilots. And if you have time, I'm, I know I'm short time, so I'm not gonna be able to dive in too much, but I would highly recommend checking this one out. Um, again, they really push the limits on what kind of responsibility we can give to kids. Um, it combines cooking curriculum with science, um, and it just does such a great job of giving students what they want if they are a classroom that is motivated by um, hands-on activities and, and student-driven projects. Know, if we had time, I'll check out that link, but I'll, I'll drop it in the chat. And then lastly, Metro Vancouver Youth for Action, again, so same kind of program they were at C to C. They were given the opportunity to engage in a youth forum. Um, well, that should say 2050, not 250. <laughs> Um, but again, if anyone uh, was aware of the youth forums that did happen um, for the 2050 Metro Vancouver um, engagements, the youth forum that was held was almost one of the biggest ones that year. And so there were forums held for all different ages, but Youth for Action um, used tools, social media, and online engagement to rally up over 300 um, youth to attend this forum, which was amazing because there was politicians, um, there was Metro Vancouver staff. Um, all there to specifically engage youth in how they think um, their region should become more sustainable in the strategies that are needed. Okay, this is just a really quick snapshot of some of the programs I talked about. Um, again, the strategies that were used to kind of launch these programs, the engagement um, that gets undertaken in order to make them a reality. Um, and I can definitely drop more links uh, if you want to learn more but essentially all of them are environmentally focused, um, outdoor ed, um, and of course, zero waste and eco cooks are the more smaller ones as well. Awesome. So I know it's kind of all over the place there, but um, I hope that you got some value out of it. And of course, like I said, you can always chat with me more if you're interested in hearing a bit more about the social media side. Um, or just online engagement in general with youth, uh, or if you want to talk about any of the programs that I brought up, there's definitely more than what I showed there. So I'm definitely happy to have a larger conversation about it if it's of interest. Thank you. Thanks, Serena. That was awesome. And I love um, with that page where it's talking about like leadership opportunities and all of these things of just like, giving back um, our local like youth network here. Um, I did some work with them and um, their sort of advisor is in high schools. And she was just like, they will not come to anything that I have designed for them. Like they will just be like, no, you're not cool. No, thank you. And she's like, you have to ask them and, and them give their input about what they want and I think you just perfectly explained how to do that and seeing how capable they are of yeah creating their own content and sharing their views and I feel like sometimes I see less communication skills than I would like with some of the older kids who are not comfortable um public speaking or things and then that kind of thing of inspiring them taking ownership of the social media and then getting more comfortable sharing their views and then maybe leading a program or leading a workshop or you know being mentors for younger students is just so valuable thanks Jude. yeah no you yeah. um i'll be uh 
picking your brain for many years to come on how to how to engage those youth. Um, very aware you were very efficient with your time, Serena, unlike me. Um, did anyone have any questions, comments or concerns um, that they want to share before we, we sign off here? Um, Again, the links are in there. Serena's consulting, if you're really interested in the work she's doing and the outdoor learning store, that not obviously do we always only sell those resources, but we're a nonprofit, so it all goes back. Um, we have a bunch of workshops there, right? So this is part of our series and we have a winter and a spring series coming up too um, that engage. We've got some climate and sustainability specific. We've got water coming up. We've got um, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so you can check it out there and take me outside's work as well. Um, we're also connected to like 30 outdoor learning partners. So there's a bunch of resources on there from um, everything from Eco Schools Canada to um, the Outdoor Council for if you want to get some training as to how to lead better outside. Um, Yes, we'll send a follow up email with links and emails and resource lists and um, the recording will go out as well. And um, yes, if you have any questions, please share. I do have one question uh, and I talked about it so much about like meeting them where they are. I totally, that's so true. Uh, when you when you have an existing community, do you have any thoughts about um, apps or uh, you know non like you know the non kind of big three or big four social media to create discussion you know to have uh, like you know to kind of have that discussion in house as it were like was it Slack or Discourse or other things that kind of worked for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's so funny. I've I've pondered that same question myself, and I've done um, WhatsApp. I've done Slack, and sometimes they work. And I find that the, I mean, the only right answer to that really is again, even with that, like I've, I've gone down so much as to just start an Instagram group with all my kids, like, and just have to, and work through that. Um, so, you know, it's really, a, and, and you can say, Hey, listen, we're doing WhatsApp or we're going to just do Slack, but if they don't, you know, the kids are stubborn, if they're not going to, you're not going to check it and then you're hounding them and it just, so, I mean, it really is what works for them. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes they do know what the best, most efficient communication is because they're in it more than we are. Um, so yeah, it's a tough, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I've definitely used more than one depending on the youth I'm working with. Get them to vote. Nice. I, one thing, um, I guess, um, I sort of mentioned, but I think ties into what Serena was saying about them having social media is like, I've got a bunch of kids. We went on a field trip to look at our watershed and then I got them to record. I did a bit of video. They did a bit of video on their phones. And then I got them to record audio of what they were doing, being on video, like being recorded with their voices was too much for them, but they were really happy to record with my fancy microphone in a room that made them look all like professional and that. And by fancy, you know, the hundred bucks is, but you know it's an investment um you don't even need that you could use a headphone mic um but getting them to narrate their own story and then we're sharing that um video out and then yeah if they create their own social media campaign to go with it like it's so valuable um for sharing that information and how do we take this five minute video and get bite-sized pieces of information how do we make it attractive so it's not just you know kids who are going to look at it but a wider community and and decision makers so yeah i think the work you're doing serena is so important in connecting those dots okay i appreciate everyone has had a long day and we should get off our screens um so yes follow-up things will happen and then our emails are in there i will put them in there so please feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, i know we're both really happy to connect with you um and ask oh i have a 50 dollar gift card to the outdoor learning store um this is tricky i'm just gonna close my eyes for a second hang on oh chris it's you Yay. um i just did a scroll uh i'm gonna send you oh could you put your email in the chat box and i will send you a, a 50 dollar gift card for participating uh, to the outdoor learning store.
thank you uh, so much for joining us. I'm going to sign off now unless anyone has anything else they would like to share. And um, thank you for coming out this evening, afternoon, and, and being a part of this. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. How did 15, oh, let's. Recording. <laughs>